And then do you share a screen to the Zoomers out there? With the... uh, yeah, you can just share a screen mm -hmm. from here. Um, okay, so our speaker is Paul Subaji from Georgia Southern University, and he will be giving talk on two problems related to tilting modules for algebraic groups. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. I do the organizers. Um, I was you guys about four years ago, I guess. Um, so we were here. Okay, let's see here. We were here from 2015 to 18, and it was a great. Sorry, I can't do two things at once. What do I want to do here? Um, Yeah. With the, is this right here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And then should I move this? Or you can just like minimize. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, sorry. I was trying to say it's great to be here while also trying to do this. And, and my wife could tell you I cannot do two things at once. Um, so anyway, it's really good to be here. It's a short, a short visit. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to be with you guys. And I was telling Dan that the, the talk I was giving, I was sort of recycling some slides I already had, confession. Uh, and then I realized that this audience knows the material much better than the previous place I gave this. So I kind of made some last second adjustments. So anyway, what I do want to talk about is two problems that are related to tilting modules. That's true. And if you were here for a talk when I was uh, a postdoc here, I was probably talking about tilting modules. And I was probably talking about at least the first problem in these two problems. Uh, we do have some new uh, results on that. And for the first problem, that's been joint work with Dan Nakano and Chris Bendel and Cornelius Pillen. So you might be somewhat familiar with that if Dan uh, presented on it. But anyway, um, let me jump in. So the first thing is when you're talking about tilting modules for algebraic groups, uh, you're talking about modular representations of reductive groups. So there is a notion of tilting modules um, that exists elsewhere, like for finite dimensional algebras. That definition is, is different than this one. The algebraic groups people sort of stole some terminology. In fact, uh, there's a very funny um, math overflow answer by Jeremy Rickard on trying to square the two definitions. And he basically accuses the algebraic groups people of not paying close enough attention with their definition, but in a kind of tongue in cheek way. But anyway, for algebraic groups, it's something for characteristic key representations. So we're dealing with groups like this, you know, a reductive group over a field of characteristic P, say algebraic but closed. Um, in the algebraic group setting, these were first introduced by, formally introduced by Steve Donkin. So I think the, the framework, the groundwork was there you know, a decade earlier, but the first kind of paper that really put the term into the, li the literature was this paper by Steve that came out in 1993. And so, you know, just, just for the point of reference, reductive groups and characteristic P were studied, you know, Chevrolet was developing that in the 50s. So this is kind of comparatively late into the, the development of the theory that tilting modules entered, but I'm kind of convinced these are the most important modules running around these days. I don't bias, but um, so that's when they entered the, the literature. Okay, so I want the two problems I'm going to talk about are this, this first one and the, the last one, but some of the reasons you might be reading about tilting modules these days are, would be papers on any of the subjects up here. So the one, the first one I want to talk about is the humphreys verma conjecture which I'll explain in a minute. Um, and that was the reason I first got interested in tilting modules. There's uh, same Humphreys, but a different conjecture by Humphreys about support varieties. And so there's a support variety conjecture about tilting modules that um, actually several people from UGA have, have worked on. So Dan's students, Bobby Cooper, and then Will Hardesty had had results about uh, verifying this conjecture in type A. And then more recently, Will with Promoted Char and Simone Reich has done continued work. So that'd be some, one of the other reasons you'd, you'd read about tilting modules. Uh, the other thing is that geometric representation theory, which is becoming increasingly you know, useful and powerful in characteristic P, uh, there's 
uh, a nice description of the objects that tilting modules correspond to um, under the Sataki uh, equivalence. And, um, and then from that, I think this uh, character formulas, which have been an area of study in the modular setting for a long time, have recently kind of honed in on characters of tilting modules, uh, specifically, I think, because of the connection to the geometric representation, the geometric results. So what I want to talk about is kind of my interest in tilting modules on the first and the last bullet point. And again, the first one was how I got introduced. And then the, the last one is some sort of recent stuff. Um, OK. So kind of the, the thing to, to say when you're defining a tilting module in the, in the setting that we're dealing with tilting modules is that your category of representations for G has um, an indexing set for the simple modules. Okay, so X plus will be the set of dominant weights. It's a partially ordered set under the, um, the root ordering. And for each lambda that's an element of this set, okay, you have a simple module of that highest weight. And then you have these two other indecomposable modules of the same highest weight lambda, the so-called standard module, uh, also known as the vial module, uh, delta lambda. And then there's this, uh, the co-standard module or induced module, uh, nablo lambda. So, um, all right, I think I put a note to myself to draw. Let me, let me actually work on the side board for a sec, just to, to say. So what you have is, um, so if this is L lambda, your simple module, then you've got the standard module, which surjects onto that as a unique simple quotient. And then you have the, the co-standard, which has a simple socle and L lambda sits inside there. So these, these are very important indecomposable modules in your category. And um, they have a bunch of uh, important cohomological uh, properties. And so let me say it like this. So if you take lambda, a uh, dominant weight, then you can form uh, a ser subcategory that I'm denoting here as C less than or equal to lambda. And what you do is you take uh, the, the subcategory of all modules whose composition factors are of the form L mu, where mu is less than or equal to lambda in, in the partial ordering. All right, and so this is a SER subcategory. And in this subcategory, uh, the objects delta lambda and nabla lambda are in here. So that means that all their composition factors um, satisfy this. And <clears throat> moreover, the standard object is the projective cover of a lambda, and the co standard is the injective hull. And so that just reflects the fact that. When it comes to extending modules, um, these two can't be extended in, you know, in, in different slots in the extension uh, by modules who have lower, uh, lower highest weight, uh, by simple modules of, of lower highest weight. So these are important modules um, cohomologically. So we then define, uh, we can define a filtration uh, on G on a G module M. So if I have a G module, I can consider um, a sequence of submodules uh, M0, M1, so on. And if I have a, a, a filtration of this kind where the successive quotients of those, uh, those M sub I are isomorphic to these nabla lambdas, then we call that a good filtration. And if I have a filtration whose successive quotients are isomorphic to the vial modules, then that's called a vial filtration. And kind of the point is that any module M that has one of these filtrations inherits the cohomological properties of the constituent pieces. Okay, so the the extension properties that the nablas have extends to the a module of the good filtration. All right, I'm doing a slide talk, so I need to slow myself down and just stop and look at you guys. Are there, are there questions so far as I'm running through this? No question is too silly. I can go off on the sideboard. Yes. Uh, you mean like Delta and Nabla belongs to that set? That means like they are generated by 
Yeah, so that, yeah, that's right. So what, what um, I kind of am glossing over is when you take the subcategory, these are in there. So that means the composition factors of these two modules are L mu's where mu is less than or equal to lambda. And if you just say in that subcategory, this is a projective module and this is an injective module. Now that's gonna, that's gonna be false when you start including larger composition factors, but that's right, in that small one, and, and looking at these, we call these like truncated subcategories. Looking at these truncated subcategories is uh, kind of an important uh, process in the game of studying the module category. Yeah, good other questions. That was good. Okay, yeah, let me, let me not go too fast. Um, I guess I should be checking to see if the chat, if anybody in cyberspace has a question, go ahead and throw it in the chat. I'll try to try to see it. Okay, so we have, um, so just to reset, you have for every dominant weight, you have a simple module, uh, a vial or standard module, and a induced or co-standard module. We talk, we define filtrations on G modules according to those. And okay, so we want to get to what a tilting module is. So a tilting module is any G module that has both of those kinds of filtrations, okay? So if it has a good filtration and it has a vial filtration, it's a tilting module. And um, if a, a module has both of those, I'll just say really quickly that in general, if it has both filtrations, it will be given by two distinct filtrations. In other words, you're not going to have a filtration where every, um, every quotient or every factor in the filtration is both uh, a nabla and a delta, right? That, that's going to be very rare. That would mean the module is semi-simple and all the factors are uh, simple tilting modules. Okay, but if a module has two different kinds of filtrations that satisfies this, it's a tilting module. Okay, so in Dawkins' uh, original paper on this topic, he kind of established the first important result about these, and I say that it was Dawkins applying Ringel because Ringel had really proved it in the setting that applies to those truncated subcategories, where you just make the argument there and it, it, uh, it applies to G modules. So what, what Duncan said was that tilting modules for algebraic groups exist. Okay, so I mean, I guess the natural question would be, does, are there modules of both of these filtrations? And yes, the answer is yes. And, um, and more than that, this is kind of the, the neat thing, there is a unique indecomposable tilting module T lambda of highest weight lambda for every dominant weight. And so let me just run back over here. So the way that the tilting module T lambda fits into the picture is it's got a good filtration and a vial filtration. And what turns out to be true is in any vial filtration of this module, the first factor in the vial filtration has to be the standard module of highest weight lambda. And in a good filtration, the last factor, the last nabla factor is the nabla lambda. So I think this um, I think this little diagram I first saw from Dan I think this was something that you at Skip and Bob had had um, kind of organized to, to show the, the the relationship. One of the things you notice just staring at that is there's almost a duality between the simple module and the tilting module in the sense that the way they sit, um, if you kind of flip the, the arrows around. And that can sort of be made precise um, in a way through something called Ringel duality, but I'm gonna, I'll leave that for now. <clears throat> okay, any, any other questions as we get the definition of tilting module? Okay. So the, the first significant thing is that now you have a fourth family of canonical and decomposable G modules indexed by uh, a dominant weight lambda. And I, I just make the quick point that since reductive groups and characteristic P, you know, often what you're doing is looking over your shoulder at characteristic zero, the, the more classical case, and looking at what was done there. And can you do that in characteristic P? Well, the first thing to say is that in over the complex numbers, this picture is all smushed into one. So the simple module of, um, is the induced, is the vial, is the tilting. So you could never have even thought up to, to study tilting modules over the complex numbers because they would not just be studying simple modules. But all of a sudden in characteristic P, 
this thing expands these now there's there's four distinct module classes for some weights those are all the same module but in general they're different okay so the tilting modules um are defined according to filtrations on categorically significant factor uh having you know filtrations with categorically significant factors and they they have very nice properties these tilting modules so kind of the two I'm going to highlight are the way they interact with tensoring and then re restriction to levy subgroup. So when you tensor to tilting modules, you again get a tilting module. Um, this is an easy result if you already know that this is true for modules with a good filtration, which is a very hard result to establish. And so um, this is Wong and Duncan and Matthew that um, have proven the, the good filtration result. But once you have that, uh, this follows pretty pretty easily. And so that's really important. That means if I take two indecomposable tilting modules and tensor them, I get a tilting module, which means that thing breaks up into a direct sum of indecomposable pieces. And the other property about tilting modules that's very nice is that if you restrict one to a levy subgroup, then it's tilting for that levy subgroup. Okay, so again, these modules are about as nice as you can you can hope in terms of the way they um, the way they work with representation theory. All right. Okay, so let me get to the first of the two problems I'm I'm talking about. So this is the Humphreys Burma conjecture and Don. Okay, we can't really see that. Um, all right. Anyway, it says Humphreys Burma conjecture and Donkin's conjecture. If you heard me give talks, you know, four or five years ago, I was talking about this exact stuff. I don't know if I expect you to remember that, but it sounds vaguely familiar. That's why. So. Here's how I'll introduce this problem. If you take the Lie algebra of your algebraic group, then we know the, the familiar story in characteristic zero, especially, is that representations for the group differentiate to representations for the Lie algebra. And in characteristic zero, those Lie algebra representations are their finite dimensional. You can exponentiate back to representations for the group. So it's a back and forth. In characteristic P, um, Really, it only goes one direction. If I have a G module, then I can get, I can you know, differentiate it to get a, a Lie algebra module. Now, many different G modules uh, for the group will kind of look like the same thing over the Lie algebra. So it's a kind of a loss of information. But then the other side of the thing that's different in characteristic P is, well, they only yield one type of representation for the Lie algebra. These are called restricted modules. But what I was really trying to get to is this question, which is um, if I have a finite dimensional representation for the Lie algebra that's restricted, um, when does that come from differentiating one for the algebraic group? So again, characteristic zero, this is a non-question. They, they all do. You just exponentiate your way backwards. But in characteristic P, this is a question. And it's a very hard question. So you have to kind of look at subproblems. All right, let me let me bring this question up into the more modern lingo. So the the way we would say this question now is we talk in terms of Frobenius kernels. Let me just introduce that. So if I have my algebraic group in characteristic P, then there's an endomorphism from this group to itself called the Frobenius morphism. The most easy, explicit example to give is for the general linear group. You take your n by n matrix and you raise raise each entry in the matrix to the pth power. And that's a morphism from the algebraic group to itself. Uh, it's an isomorphism on the k points of the group, but as a scheme map, it's not um, it's not an isomorphism. And so there's a kernel to that, and that, that kernel is a scheme theoretic kernel called the Frobenius kernel, which is noted as g sub one. And so the category of modules for the Frobenius kernel is equivalent to the restricted modules for the Lie algebra. So you can you talk about these interchangeably, and so the more common, like in in our papers, we typically talk about Frobenius kernel representations. So the question is, which modules for the Frobenius kernel come from G modules? And <clears throat> all right, so to discuss this, we we first want to start inside our set of dominant weights and take a, a finite subset that's known as the P-restricted weight. So um, let, let me just write this on the board for So if, for example, 
you're dealing with um, you're dealing with SLN, and so in this case, your dominant ways to identify well, yeah, this would be like z greater than or equal to zero to the n minus one. Then your set of restricted weights would just look like um, things in the form a1, a2, an minus 1, where ai is less than p, bigger than or equal to 0. So this is your set of p-restricted weights. So it's a finite set for, for any fixed group. And kind of the first result on this, this you know, first sort of positive answer to this question was given by Curtis in uh, 1960, where he said, well, the, the simple modules for the Frobenius kernel all lift to modules for the algebraic group and where there's simple modules upstairs. And specifically, if I think of my simple modules for the algebraic group as being indexed by dominant weights, if that index comes from the set of few restricted weights, then that's, that's one of the modules that <clears throat> differentiates with a simple module for, for G, for the Lie algebra. I think you want simply connected to Charlie Ash. Um, yes, you're going to miss weights if you don't have simply connected. That, that's right. That's right. Let's see. I, say, I, I get turned around because I have phrased this uh, problem uh, backwards sometimes. So I'll start with thinking Frobenius kernel and then going to the group. So if you start with the Frobenius kernel, it always lifts the one for the group. Um, but yeah, you're right, Dan. You need simply connected to get all the weights. So you could probably fix that by making x plus the weights as a group, or whichever form of the group you're dealing with. Yes, that would be that would be like the dominant weights that actually correspond to modules for that group. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, Oh, okay. Restricted. That means that your um, the Lie algebra, like as a Lie algebra, the representations uh, would include any legitimate Lie algebra representation. So a map to you know vector space where the brackets preserved. In characteristic P, your the Lie algebra for your group has an additional structure called a P restriction map, and there's something called a, a, rep, a P restricted representation for the Lie algebra. So that would be a representation that also respects this additional structure. And what turns out to be true is if you start with the representation for the algebraic group and you differentiate it from one for the Lie algebra, it is going to be restricted, P restricted. So the only ones that you could see for the Lie algebra that lift to the group have to be from that subset of P restricted. But then it turns out the category, that category of representations is equivalent to the category of representations for the Frobenius kernel. And so most of the time we prefer to use that language. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? If lambda is not an X1, is LM still simple G1? Uh, no, because um, you take the Steinberg tensor, you, you know the answer you're trying to, Oh. <laughs> you're smirking, so I wasn't sure if you're just trying to push it. Uh, that's, that's okay. So that's okay. No, I made it take two seconds. Right, you have to think about what's the what's the counterexample. So okay, so so this was like I said, this was a, a you know one of the oldest results in the area, right? So this is going back to 1960 again. Chevalier's in the 50s developing reductive groups over arbitrary fields. So, okay, so the next kind of, I guess, logical place you would check for a, um, a module for the Frobenius kernel that might lift to one for the algebraic group is to take, so in the category of modules for the Frobenius kernel, the simple modules have projective covers, which are also the injective hull of the, of the module. And these are finite dimensional modules. And so the question was, uh, well, actually, there was a, conjecture that was really a claimed proof that the proof was going to be in an upcoming paper and it turned out not to, there was a gap in it. So it's become known as the Humphreys Verma conjecture, but it was really stated as a result that it kind of had to get retracted, was that um, the projective cover over the Frobenius kernel of 
the, the simple modules, uh, the P-restricted simple modules, um, carry a G structure. And this was um, already known at the time to be true for like SL2 by a result due to Jaya Kumar. So there was, there was some evidence that this might be true in general. Um, again, the proof they had in mind had, had a gap. And I'll say later that their gap really was, you couldn't be reconciled because the method they were trying to use, we see there's something wrong with it. So here's what ended up being true. Shortly after their, their um, again, conjecture, Ballard showed that it's true when P was bigger than or equal to 3H minus three, where here H is the coxeter number of the group. So for SLN, uh, H would equal N. Just give you a kind of an idea of the magnitude here. So Ballard showed it for, for P bigger than or equal to 3H minus three. If the characteristic was that big, the result was true. Janssen sharpened this down to 2H minus two, uh, two years later. And he, he did much more than that because he showed that the G structure it lifted to was unique. So, um, so the, the projective covers, um, for the projective and decomposable G1 modules lift to G modules and the lifting is a unique G module that it lifts to each one. Um, and like I said, Jay Kumar, his result came out or was appeared in 1974, but I mean, it was known at the time of the humphreys verma conjecture, uh, showed that it was true for SL2 for all, all P. Of course, that bound is gonna work for all P for SL2, 2H minus two uh, is two, but, um, and then for SL3, it was known to hold for all characteristics. Uh, Janssen just observes this in his book. I don't know who to credit it to, um, I guess Janssen, um, but he doesn't really, he just makes the observation. Um, another thing to, to note as you're, you're looking at this is there's a unique simple module for the Frobenius kernel that's also projective for the Frobenius kernel, and it's the Steinberg module. So this is the simple module that has the largest possible restricted, um, the rest P-restricted weight. And so, um, so this is kind of what was known, and in every case that the lifting the, that the results that the projective and decomposables could lift to G in every case that was known, it later was seen that these were all tilting modules. So again, tilting modules weren't a thing back in 1980, but once that definition uh, you know, entered the, the literature, these were all seen to be tilting. They had good filtrations and biofiltrations. So Duncan made, um, you know, I guess a, a kind of an obvious then conjecture off of this, which is, well, probably, well, he, he didn't say probably. He said the tilting module um, should be the lift of this projective and decomposable module for, for all primes, okay? And this was, again, this was in that paper that appeared in 93, but I, I have good, um, on good authority that it was actually announced in 1990 because Dan has his notes from a talk when Steve made that exact. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I just came up in conversations with Henning Anderson. So it turns out that and I think this is what happened is Duncan actually had renal preprint. You know, preprint is renal stable. Yes. So he actually had a head start on tilting modules. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mean, it was stated in 19. Like, like, why was he talking about 1990? Right, right. And all the other literature came out after the that. That's okay. That's a good. So yeah, what Dan was saying is that Ringel's paper, which appeared in 91, of course, that was circulating before it appeared. I think Steve found it in a drawer while visiting yeah. um, Ringel. I mean, Steve tells the story. Um, yeah, that's right. There's one thing that I, I kind of want you to avert your eyes from. I'm just giving you the, the full story. But this, this weight in here always used to make my eyes glaze over when I looked at it. Like, what in the world is the statement saying? Well, all it's saying is that the, the claim is that this module for the Fermenius kernel lifts to its tilting module. And it, and it turns out that unlike with other highest weight, oh, not there anymore, other highest weight modules, this, um, this notation, the lambda in there is to signify that over G1, this is the projective cover of L lambda, which really does have highest weight lambda. The highest weight of this module is not lambda. It's this thing right here. So this, this has to be the tilting module that would be isomorphic to Q1 if it lifts. And this is basically what you're doing is you taking this weight lambda 
and you're reflecting it through the Steinberg way. So you run it to the Steinberg and then run it across. That's what this thing is. Okay, so Duncan makes this conjecture. It's you know early 90s. And I was really interested in the Humphreys Verma conjecture. I really didn't know a whole lot about Duncan's conjecture. And when I was a postdoc here, Dan encouraged me to, to take a look at a paper he had written with Tobias Kildatov, who had visited, I think maybe the year before, two years before. And they were dealing with uh, problems related to Duncan's conjecture and, and, and related um, phenomena in the category. And I kind of resisted at first, you know, well, maybe I'll get around to looking at it. Eventually, I'm a little slow on the draw, but eventually I realized, you know, Dan's always giving good advice. Let me go ahead and read this paper. And it was, it was exactly what I needed to read. It, it, it really framed things in the right way. And I think it got the ball rolling for us to do some stuff. So, um, so anytime I write BNPS, this is joint work with Chris Bendel, Dan Nakano, and Cornelius Pillen. And so the four of us started working on this problem several years ago. And uh, this, this Donkin's conjecture. And here's what we, here's what we found. So the first thing we found, and this was, we knew we were attacking the problem in the right way, but I honestly thought we were going to prove it. So we were trying to verify that this conjecture was right. And we were trying to verify it in, in low rank cases and work our way up. <clears throat> and it turned out that as we we're looking at the, the simple algebraic group of type G2, we thought we had a proof for, for uh, P equals two, but um, it, yeah, it turned out as we were doing some computations, we realized, hold on, there's something wrong here in the module structure. Uh, something was going wrong that shouldn't be able to happen if the tilting module conjecture was true. And what we found was, in fact, the tilting module conjecture failed there. So that was kind of it. That was 2019, and that was the first, you know, instance where the tilting module conjecture was shown to be false. So therefore, Donkin's conjecture is not true in general. There must be some additional hypothesis. A couple of years later, um, we were continuing to look at this, and we said, well, there's actually other counterexamples. So if you have a simple algebraic group of type, root system type BN, where N is bigger than or equal to three, and again, in characteristic two, it fails. And then in uh, root type C3, when P equals three, we have a counterexample. Um, this one's noteworthy because these are bad primes for the root systems, if that means anything. Um, this is not a bad prime. So this is the first non-bad characteristic counterexample. Now, um, if you force me to say what's going to happen, we think that for type CN, where N is prime and P is equal to N, that there would also, it would also fail. So we, we think that the counterexample we found here, we could probably produce for, for the various CN um, using a, a similar argument. Okay, now, <clears throat> okay, so that, I mean, that was, in, the, in a lot of ways, this was very clarifying because um, I don't know if I've, so John Carlson was giving a talk in Seattle, I think in 2012, and he said, if you're trying to prove something and you can't prove it, maybe it's false. <laughs> and uh, it was very satisfying to know this thing was actually not right because I, we were really banging our heads against the wall and thought we had these good angles of this conjecture. And so to finally realize, you know, it actually is just not going to be true in general. And this was, this was very satisfying. Um, I wanted it to be true, but unfortunately we can only report what's accurate. So um, all right, so that was one half of kind of the, the BNPS work on this conjecture is to realize it's, it's wrong in a number of cases, at least in, in these situations there. The other side of it is we, yeah. So, so you might want to mention that it fails for like the other root systems too, like your E6, E7, F4, no, I guess. By levy, yeah, by any anything that sits inside as a levy subgroup, yeah. That's right, I didn't, I wasn't comprehensive on that. Yeah, so we, we have counterexamples for all root systems other than type A1 and B2. That's right. The other side of the 
problem was okay so we see that it doesn't hold in all cases but we were trying to figure out you know when does it hold in other words wh where's the magic cutoff where where Duncan's conjecture is right i mean again it it's no higher than two times the coxer number minus two okay you're definitely in the clear when you get there that's Janssen's result we find counterexamples in very low characteristics so what's happening in, in between and again if you asked me to make a call on it i'd say probably from the Coxeter number up, you're, you're safe. But again, that's just a guess. So we, the other side of it is we're trying to verify cases. And so we, this is what we were able to verify. For G2, a simple group of type G2, the only situation it fails in is, is the prime P equals two. So if P is bigger than two, um, it holds. Um, for root system uh, type B2, it holds for all P. And also for A3, so for, for SL4, it holds for all primes. And so in red, I just am highlighting all the primes you don't already get from Janssen's bound. So these are the ones we had to, had to verify. And I'm not gonna get into all the techniques we used here. I mean, G2P equals seven alone was, <laughs> that was one that was holding us up because it was so complicated. We, we kind of threw the, the kitchen sink at this problem to kind of pick off all these different cases. But let me just give you at least in a big picture I'm not going to get close to where I was hoping to get to. In a big picture, let me tell you sort of what we see happening behind the scenes. So there was a question in Janssen's 1980 paper where he, he proved that, that good bound of P bigger than or equal to 2H minus 2, where he asked if a vial module has uh, what he called a P vial filtration. Now, a P vial filtration means... Um, that you can have a you have a filtration of submodules on this vial module such that the factors the the, the factors of this uh, filtration look like modules of this form here where what we're doing is we're taking a simple module g module a p restricted highest weight and then we're tensoring with the Frobenius twist of a, the vial module of highest weight mu sub one. Okay, so you have the Frobenius morphism on the group. You can pull back modules via that morphism, and that's what the Frobenius twist means. And so he'd ask the question, does every vial module have a p-vial filtration? And, you know, if you're just sitting here looking at this for the first time, haven't had the benefit to think about this, and it's like unclear if this is hard or easy to, to analyze. But the fact was, um, there was very little information about this. So prior to um, 2019, the only answers were, were affirmative answers. So cases where you could, you could verify that this did hold. So um, either by being selective on the weight lambda that you're going to say it's true for, or being very selective on the characteristic. Um, so there were some answers. Um, Two really important papers here were one by uh, Brian Parshall and Ernst Scott, where they looked at this question. And then also this paper I, I referenced earlier by Tobias Kildatoff and Dan. And these both appeared in 2015. And uh, their paper explicitly is on p vial filtrations. And then Dan and Tobias covered uh, a number of topics and sort of how these various, this question and a different uh, conjecture of Donkin's interacted with the tilting module conjecture. So these are really, I think, sparked a lot of what's happened the last few years. And so the, the thing I want to say is that all of our counterexamples to Donkin's conjecture and all of our verifications have somehow really involved kind of negative or positive answers to Janssen's question. So the first thing is, we did find negative answers, cases where Janssen's question had, the, there, there were vial modules that did not have p-vial filtrations. So that was the first time that was observed. And our counterexamples, every time we find them, we see that, that phenomena occurring. Then on the other hand, we're able to verify Donkin's conjecture by verifying that certain vial modules have these p-vial filtrations. And so somehow there's a connection between these. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and this is kind of, I think, philosophically important to me, is that algebraic groups in characteristic P and quantum groups at a P through to unity are often put side by side for comparison. And 
you know, people have studied algebraic groups looking at the quantum groups. And, and here's where there's a point of departure. The quantum groups, they have a Frobenius morphism, but it's not an endomorphism. It goes from the quantum group to the classical enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra and uh, characteristic zero. And what that means is anytime you have things with Frobenius twists, it behaves very differently to the quantum group. And in particular, Yasin's question for the quantum group is very easily answered uh, in the affirmative. So for the algebraic group, this doesn't always happen. And so that's, um, yeah. Okay, let me stop for a second, just ask if there's a question. Yeah. A quantum group situation is like modules are just simple. Like, you know, you know, that's right. That's right. This is actually a simple module for the quantum group, and that's just asking if it has a composition series, which is that's right. Yeah. Good. Good point. Um, Tamana, what do you? Yeah. What's that? Oh, um, nothing other than this is dominant. This is dominant, and and the, this one's too restricted dominant. Yeah, it's um. Basically, what you do is if you had a dominant weight, you would take like a p adic decomposition of that thing. So you'd have a p restricted part plus p times something dominant, and then you would decompose. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you, what time does the, the thing typically till? Till 10 till or? And do quite. Okay, so let me do five more minutes and then I'll. Yes. Okay. So you would hope that when, because things are so nice when P is that big, that you would have an answer here. And even just using that bound on P, the answer is not at all clear. Um, what Parshall and Scott did is they said if P was that big and Lustig's conjecture holds, which we now know, <laughs> shut, which I'm about to say in a second, shoves your prime way out there, then yes. Um, but after what I'm about to say, what Jordy did, well, that makes that hypothesis um, way too strong. Yeah. So, so it is a very hard question. I think uh, I don't know if Dan agrees, but I think of the various questions we're kicking around in this area, answering this one is is I think the hardest um, has the most. Yeah. But I also think the reason it's probably so hard is because whatever mysterious is happening, for example, with what Jordy found with Lucic's conjecture probably is maybe has something to do with this, this issue here, which again, for the quantum groups a non-issue and the quantum group, Lucic's conjecture is very nice. It's true, you know, um, when L is bigger than the Cox or nothing. So. Other, other questions? So anyway, this, this is kind of some of the ingredients that were going on in the background. And I think this is, um, yeah, this is all I'll say on that. Okay, now the second, <laughs> in three minutes, the second question, that's, that's fine, really, is that uh, the second thing I've been thinking about is character formulas of tilting modules. And so let me try to explain why I care about these. And um, yeah, this will be where we end. So first of all, you fix your maximal torus in G. I should have done that at the beginning of the talk, but all right, uh, never too late. And um, if I have a, a G module M, it restricts to one for the torus. I'm going to call CHM the character of this module. So it just means you restricted the torus, breaks up as a direct sum of one dimensional representations. Keep track of this. Um, okay. So, long standing old problem was what's the character of the simple modules L lambda? Now, for the characteristic zero, the complex case, Vial's character formula is what answers this. So, you know, I think if you're starting out in characteristic P, you're wondering what do we have in place of his formula? And so the first thing to say in characteristic P is that Steinberg's tensor product theorem, which I've kind of alluded to before, which says if you have L lambda plus P lambda prime, that's isomorphic to L lambda tensor L lambda prime tw for being as twisted. Because of that, it turns out that really all you need to know is the character for L lambda where lambda is P restricted. Then you can just apply uh, uh, the Steinberg tensor product theorem and that will, that will give you everything. So one approach to this problem has been to use the character of the standard or co-standard modules. They have the same character. So I'll just do the standard module. 
The standard module's character is the same as the character of the irreduced, the simple module in characteristic zero, which is given by, I'm writing it as this um, Euler characteristic, chi of lambda, that's the what Vial's character formula computes. And the, the reason we can do this is because the Vial characters form a basis for the, the invariant ring of characters where the character of L lambda is going to live. And so you can write it, you can express it in that basis. The coefficients on the right are integer, but they're going to include positive and negative coefficients. So this is always true. The problem is, you know, what are those coefficients? So Lustig's conjecture, which you might see the bound on this various different ways. I'm just going to go with this one for now. This is the original, I think, conjecture is that if you want to get this for all the P restricted weights, then if, if P is bigger than or equal to 2H minus three, those coefficients will be given by Kazan Lustig polynomials evaluated at one, certain one. And what turned out to be correct is that if P was really big, um, this conjecture is true. And that was first shown by Anderson, Janssen, Zorgel in a non-constructive way. So there exists a characteristic where you're big enough, but you know we don't know if you're there yet. Um, and the phi big actually was able to produce explicit bounds, and they're huge. And and then Jordy had this you know surprising um, discovery in 2000. Well, announced in 2013. Let's talk with Dan about this. Um, it, I think it appeared in print in 2017. That no, it's not true in general. In fact, it fails in in a, in a lot of characteristics. In fact, the failure is so bad. You can't even have any reasonable <coughs> bound on your character. You can't have a function in the Coxer number that's like, I don't know if it's sub exponential, maybe. I mean, it has to be, it has to be a huge, um, the bound is going to have to be huge, which Phi big produce huge bounds, and those end up being a lot sharper than people probably realize. Okay, so Lucid's conjecture is not going to give you the answer in general. And so the more recent thing is to look at characters of tilting modules and try to attack it this way. So um, uh, I'm a minute over. I'll just do two more minutes. Is that okay? All right. So your tilting module has a vial filtration. Okay, Bill's the department chair. So I have a few minutes. <laughs> So T lambda has a, a vial filtration. So, um, well, again, its character is going to be expressible as a sum of vial characters, but now you can assume that the coefficients are non-negative because this thing has a filtration by submodules whose characters are given by these, these things. Um, and it's an interesting question to ask, what are the characters of these tilting modules? It turns out that that's actually a harder question in general. Um, so one of the things about the those cohomological properties of standard and co-standard modules is that the number of times that um, the number of times that the standard module delta mu appears in T lambda is given by just computing the dimension of the G homomorphisms from the tilting module to um, nabla mu. All right, now, okay. So what happened is uh, Simone Rich and Jordi Williamson started kind of trying to put back together, not Lustig's conjecture, but a different character conjecture. And, and they did it in terms of um, tilting modules. So what they said is the multiplicities, what was these, multi these multiplicities here, the D, U, lambda, ought to be computable by not Kazan Lustig polynomials, but something called P Kazan Lustig polynomials. I won't pretend to know a lot about them, but I've heard, I've heard Jordy say that they are much harder to compute than Kazan Lustig polynomials. Actually, Tamani, you might be more of an expert on this. I don't know. Um, they made this conjecture if P was bigger than the Coxeter number of the group, and it, they showed it was true in type A in, their, in the paper they conjectured it. Later, um, Achara, Makisumi, Rich, Williamson proved it was true for all types under the bound that they conjectured, P bigger than H. And then, was this announced at the Cantrell? I don't know. Yeah. So, Reese Williamson proved it was true actually for all P. So actually they beat their conjecture um, that they're, that the multiplicities are computed by P cause on Lucid polynomials. And the first time I heard that was when Jordy was here in 2019. Um, so that was great. So what does that have to do with this, the simple characters? Well, if you, um, 
So, okay, just, just for simplicity, if I have a P restricted weight lambda, I'm going to set lambda hat to be this, this weight over here that's the tilting module weight that would be the projective cover. Anyway, so if P is bigger than or equal to 2H minus 2, um, the T lambda hat using the Janssen argument from 1980 is a projective cover and injective hull for L lambda, not for the Frobenius kernel, it is down there, but to this truncated sub, for a truncated subcategory of G modules. And what happens then is it turns out that the multiplicity of nabla mu and T lambda hat is then just given by the number of uh, composition factors L lambda in nabla mu. And so what I'm getting at is that this allows you to deduce the characters of the simple modules from the characters of the tilting modules. Because if you know these characters, you know how many times the, the vial characters appear. And that tells you the composition multiplicities on the right. And that's, that's all you need. Now, if P is less than 2H minus 2, it's killing me here. Can I, can I do something? Uh, no, OK. If P is less than 2H minus 2, that thing about being a projective object in the truncated subcategory is out the window. It's not going to be true. But as long as Donkin's conjecture still holds that T that says T lambda hat is isomorphic to Q1 lambda, then you can work in the category of G1T modules where you replace everything in sight with the G1T analogs of the simple module. There's a G1T simple of the same highest weight. These modules get re placed by baby Verma modules that have a similar role. And, um, and now you get um, the, the, okay, you get a similar palm composition multiplicity result. So again, parallel. The long and short of it is you can still deduce the simple characters from the tilting characters. So the question then became, well, what happens if Dawkins conjecture fails? That's not a hypothetical. We know it fails now. And so, this is where I kind of started getting interested in this question. And, and the first thing was that the simple characters can still be deduced from the characters of the tilting modules um, under this situation. You have to use something called stable lifting. It was something that uh, Brian Parshall and Larry Scott worked on. Anyway, I, I'm kind of out of time, so I want to, yeah, let, let me go ahead and just speed through this. So that was the first thing I was interested in. The corollary then was, well, that means you can use the Reach williamson tilting character formula to get all the simple characters in principle for all P using this observation. Here's the, here's the, the brutal honesty of it. That's great theoretically. In practice, you'll never get it this way. The PKL polynomials are too hard to compute. They're uh, recursive in nature. The higher the weight goes, the worse the recursion. The stable lifting forces you to take a weight and shove it really far up in the dominant chamber and now your recursion just became an absolute nightmare. So you, you're never going to compute using this, but it's more of a theoretical statement. And so, um, all right, I have a little bit more, but I think I'm, I'm going to stop here because I'm out of time. So thank you. Okay, you're queuing me up for the next part. I'm saying good. <laughs> that's, no, that's awesome. So yeah, what I was so the, the thought is tilting tilting characters are have too much information in them. So the Reach Williamson result is great because it gives an algorithm for all tilting modules, which is a super hard problem. If you only care about the simple characters, you only really care about the tilting modules whose highest weights are in the re P-restricted region above the Steinberg weight. So, so some, some finite subset. And so the hope that what I'm trying to figure out is, can you just specialize to those tilting modules and find some combinatorial gadgets somewhere in between Kazan-Lusik and P-Kazan-Lusik polynomials that will just do that limited set? I, I think that might be what you're asking. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly the hope. That was the next three slides we're going to get to ours.
just have one question. Paul. Yeah. Like, when you say it's page two, like, can you program a computer to do it, or is it so hard that, like, you have programming computers, like, it's impossible to program? Like, so, actually, Twan, do, do you know much about the HTML? Yeah. Like, I just, I thought it's not that hard to compute, but you just said, like, it's hard. I don't know, like, I will just learn, like, it's like you do those diagrammatic calculations. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm just learning that, and I said, like, it's, I don't know, like, how hard it can get. Okay, yeah, so like for me to answer, I've never tried. I know that I'm going off of, I think it was a talk that Jordy gave where he made some comparison of the order of difficulty between cause on this and P cause on this thing. And he said it was like orders of magnitude harder to do the P. And then I think we had asked somebody in this area to, could you compute it for like, well, so you know. Yes. We wanted to prove the docking conjecture for G2 and P plus 7. And so we asked Pamo whether he can compute the peak on on that Yeah, the answer was like what what he, what he could get to you was going to be a much simpler case. Right. So even so, rank two. Yeah, I see. I remember like, so now, now like, so like the homotopy use of the topological space are actually theoretically conceivable. But I remember, but of course this is a, a long time ago, but, but what I would read in the paper about it is that it's so hyper exponential that it's not even like you can't even implement it. Even like, I, and I, you know, I, of course, this is in the sixties, but you know, you, still there are things that are just out of out of you know even just like two, you can still be out of touch. Well, and like you know, one of the things so I told Brian, I've recently found a paper by Brian that I've been interested in. If you take alcoves and you took the set of restricted alcoves for a root system. And you're trying to figure out how many dominant alcoves are strongly linked less than that the top restricted alcove. So you've done some related things with the Janssen region. Like the number grows so fast. I, I programmed the computer to do this. And for like SLN, it goes like 1, 2, 8, 52, and somewhere around 470 something, 5,000 something, 83,000. I mean, it grows like, um, yeah, like hyper I mean, it's just. And that's just to find how many alcoves you have. Now you would be doing recursive stuff where all of those sub things are going into the recursion. I think it'd be a nightmare, I guess it's a long and short. So we need quantum computers for Possibly. That's not totally a joke. That's not totally, no, that's not a joke. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, good, good question though, that's... So yeah, I kind of took too long in the first half, but I want to talk more about the computation to the end. But yeah, you, were, you guys are asking all the, I think all the right questions, right? Yeah, nice. Okay. <laughs>